my name is Caleb Musgrave. Kinnan in Dishna Kazbaz and Ashim Dorem, Mishasagi and Ishnabe in Nandal. Pamanash Koleang and Donjaba. My name is Caleb from Hiawatha First Nation, Mississauga Ojibwe. We were founded back in November of 2008, uh, so going on 10 years this coming fall. And uh, at first we started mostly with youth and then grew from there into teaching more adults, mainly because of insurance, just for that reason alone. We still do a lot of programs with youth, so we teach everything from kindergarten, daycare, all the way up to university level, uh, military personnel. We teach uh, university groups themselves, college groups, outdoors clubs, uh, television producers, you name it. We teach everybody. So uh, very open platform. We, we cater to whoever we have to teach. Um, but again, our, our passion is with youth, mostly in the uh, high school, going into post-secondary age bracket. Uh, that's kind of my preference because you can be, be a little bit, you can expect them to be a little bit more safer with a knife than a five-year-old. Like, well, at the same time, my boy uses an axe and he's five, so that's it depends on the kid. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so we teach everything from traditional survival skills, like old school, just Nishinaabe style bush skills, as well as modern, ta uh, modern uh, tactics on survival, so modern technology, modern techniques, the understanding of, of the science of hypothermia, etc., 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 and then we go into more traditional arts, so baskets, traditional food systems. We do everything from ricing programs to acorn processing workshops, maple sugar process workshops. This uh, in two weeks we're gonna be doing a our third year doing it of making maple sugar without any steel containers, steel vessels or anything like that. Everything's done completely pre-contact style. So clay vessels, bark baskets, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then we go all the way to the more advanced stuff. So this coming May, we're going to be teaching how to build birch bark canoes. We build dugout canoes. We Our goal is one dugout canoe, canoe per year per community in the Mississauga Territory. So this year we're finalizing one for Hiawatha. Then we're going to be starting one for Curve Lake. And then we're going to be starting one for Alderville. One for Scugog, eventually maybe for Mississauga, and then eventually potentially one for New Credit. And the objective behind that is to have dugout, traditional dugout canoes that are from this region, historically accurate, um, being used by the youth to come together in our in uh, what's sometimes known as a regatta, get together on a certain lake. So maybe we'll stop at Curve Lake one year, have everybody paddle to Curve Lake. One year paddle everyone to Rice Lake on the North Shore for Hiawatha, South Shore for Alderville and have them learn the traditional arts of these canoes and the vessels that we use them for, Let these and have them open for the community to use so they can take these canoes out to set nets. They can take these to go out and spear fish, go out and rice with them, go out and do night fishing with them, hunting ducks, whatever it may be. So we, have, uh, we wear a lot of hats. We have a lot of projects that happen from everything from one-day programs to one-month intensives, uh, teaching every kind of age bracket. We're eclectic I think is the best term to call us or at least me being eccentric I suppose mm -hmm. my main goal is to a lot of people say we want to preserve our traditional ways I don't want to preserve anything preserve is what I do with my pickles I that's what something you keep in a in a cupboard and don't let rot that's all that is when you look at preserving you're looking at a museum you're looking at a, a library and those things are stuffy and they're dead we want to cause a resurgence the entire concept of Canadian bushcraft is to get our people using our traditional skills and our traditional material culture in our daily life. So when it comes down to understanding our language, our language is land-based. Uh, and I've always appreciated there's a living and learning on the land course here at Trent. But we can go deeper. We can definitely go deeper. When you look at words like metigwa buck for a hickory tree, well, what the hell does that mean? Well, it means a hickory. No, it means the tree that we make the bows from. When we took it, we look at Wetigop, which is a basswood. It means a basswood? No, it means the tree that makes rope. When we look at uh, Gagagi Mints, which is uh, the hemlock, a lot of people get really confused by that because they hear Gagagi and they're thinking it's a raven, but it's actually saying Gagag. And then means talking about that tree's life and what it can do. And Gag is porcupine. And so Anishinaabe people in the springtime, this time of year, we go porcupine hunting. And that's the tree you go to to start finding that porcupine. And so learning the language revitalization, we talk about language revitalization all the time, but to become more thorough with our language, you have to understand the language. And to understand the language, you have to understand the land. And so for me, it's revitalization and resurgence and all those other key words that start with re, uh, revitalization, resurgence, 
relearning everything else like that. It's not that we have to teach our kids this. It's that we our kids have to be granted the chance to remember it. There's a big difference between talking and planning and talking and planning. That's what I see a lot of people do and just doing. And we may not always be right with what we're doing, but it comes out right. And everything comes out and everybody learns from it in a good way. And it's always in a good way. When we look at best learning practices, experiential is my, is my way. Uh, at the college level where I teach, uh, I teach experiential. When my students come into the classroom, I, I do lectures. And they become astronomers. They start looking at the ceiling real quick. They're not paying attention. The minute I pull out a knife and show them how to shave that wood to make, bat, to make, a, shave that wood to make a trap trigger or take the bark off to make medicine, they're paying attention. Maybe just because I have a knife in my hand. I don't know. But they seem to be paying attention to everything that's going on. When we make baskets with them, they understand the importance of those baskets. Even the non-Indigenous students that are taking our courses, when we took them to the sugar bush, they understood the importance of that sugar because of how much work it took to go from sap to sugar, not just syrup, but sugar, and actually make sugar. And they understood like that at one time in our culture, 200 pounds per person per household. That's a lot of work. And they just did all this and were sweating and panting and they get it. They understand that the stereotype of a lazy Indian doesn't exist. They were always working in the land. Kids learn best with their hands. And what they can touch, they can taste, they can feel, they can smell. You can't, like, yeah, paper has a certain nice smell to it, but that's as far as it goes. Ink only has so much smell before you might start getting concerned about what they're doing. The land works. And we've, like, you look at everything all the way back to the academia tree of Greece. Every culture, not just Anishinaabe people or indigenous folk, every culture, the kids learn better on the land. And that concept of a king on the land, it's, it's vital. It's the best way to learn. Mm. Practical application is really the only way you can grade. I can cheat on a paper. I'm not going to admit that I ever did, but I can cheat on a paper. I can cheat on an exam. I can cheat on a quiz. I can cheat on an essay. I can plagiarize. You can't cheat the land. If you can't carve a spoon to make that uh, to feed yourself with that soup, then you then you're going hungry. That's the test, and so we see it every day. And when I see success beyond that, it's the fact that I see their confidence level explode. Indigenous education to me is a decolonized. That's a key word out there these days, catchphrase. Um, a decolonized perspective of the sciences around us. So when it comes down to mathematics, there's an amazing program out in Minnesota or Wisconsin where the Anishinaabe Moen teacher is their math teacher. And he teaches only in the language. And the kids are learning how to subtract and add and multiply and divide. And he's also bringing in practical application of math. So these kids are doing really, really, really well. Look at how well a kid does when you explain fractions by coins. Because all kids understand monetary value. Now let's go into dividing by dividing up that fish or weighing out the amount of sugar we gather in the sugar bush and putting that all together. That's a de We want to say that's decolonized. I kind of find that word kind of just a catchphrase to get better funding. But a decolonized perspective or at least an indigenized perspective of everything. So whether it's chemistry, astronomy, mathematics, biology, specifically zoology or human biology, whatever it may be, understanding those things from your indigenous ways and in, including our indigenous teachings, whether they're Haida or Gwich'in or Klicho or Anishinaabe, whatever they may be, and integrating those into our perspective of our understanding. And also teaching in our way that we've always done. Um, our kids aren't made, no kid is made to be put into a box-shaped room at a box-shaped table and listen to a box-shaped headed teacher tell them how to fit in a box. No one's taught, no one can do that because we're not meant to do that. That it, It's a very, even for European folk, it's a very unnatural thing for anybody. And so when I say like learning from an indigenous way it goes beyond that. We, we try to get out as much as possible the young kids to help elders in the community. And those elders, they could be just old folk who don't have any traditional teachings at all, but they might speak the language. 
and those kids are learning the language while they're working with them, shoveling driveways, cutting wood, pounding basket splints for them, peeling bark and bringing bark over them, gathering medicines for them. Those kids are learning and the elders will tell them what they need it, what they need, what they need it for, and how it's made. That's how we learned growing up. And then you go out with that uncle or that auntie here, and they're the ones that give you the physical training. And so that's kind of my role with a lot of the young boys in our community, the young girls in our community. I take them out, they learn to race. They first learn how to paddle a canoe because we've had quite a few tippings with half a canoe load of rice. But yeah, well, at least we seeded that part of the bay. That was a good part. Um, but learning how to paddle a canoe, learning all those things about it, learning hydrology in that sense, learning how the Archimedes principle of how buoyancy works. We've explained like how f you can get it so loaded without that canoe sinking because it still is displacing enough water to be lighter than the water's density. And the kids understand that stuff. Whereas if you told them that stuff in a classroom, their heads would be astronomy. They'd be going up there looking at the stars again. They don't care, but they care when they're doing it. What I would love to see, but I don't know if it will happen because in that, in that short of a time, um, language becoming mandatory in every, in every form of classroom. As I said with my friend out in Minnesota who's teaching in the language only. Immersion of our language and integration of our language into every science uh, and every study, whether it's history or whatnot. We have our own perspective of history as well, and that needs to be brought to the forefront in classrooms. Um, when it comes down to the current elementary and secondary and post-secondary systems and curriculums, it's going to be challenging, which constantly brings me back to my next point of we teach our kids. We have our schools. We do those programs and we develop the curriculum and we develop their grading scheme and we develop their rubrics and we develop their syllabus. That, um, you may want to call that sovereignty, you may want to call that self-determination or self-government. Uh, I call that practicality. We know what's best for our children because we are those children and those children are our future, not Canada's future. They're our future. And so why would we expect Canada to be able to teach them properly? So what I would like to see is Hiawatha, Curve Lake. Curve Lake's already got one, but they're trying to expand it and get a little bigger. I, mean, I look at them as a key stone on that subject in this area. But for Alderville and Hiawatha and Scugog and Rama and Beausoleil and Georgian Island and all of our cousins in New Credit and, and beyond, all Anishinaabe and then all Haudenosaunee and other indigenous nations, teach your own damn kids. Get your own schools built. We have the money. We have the knowledge. We have the know-how. We just have to get the nerve to stand up against the federal government and the provincial government when it comes down to the Board of Education and everything and say, no, we teach them. We will teach them. And we'll teach them our way. And that, like, you look at how successful the root schools of New Zealand have been for the Maori. Period. There. There's your facts right there. You look at the Seminole schools. You look at the Nishinaabe schools down in uh, Lac Flambeau and Mill Lac. You look at the, the, school, the freedom schools that are happening in uh, Lakota Territory and even further south. I mean, if Canadians that have the money can do, can do Montessori and Waldorf and all that fancy stuff, I think we have the funding to be able to make our own school that fits the curriculums and fitting it our way. That's, that's my dream. That's what I would love to see. At the end of the day, it's not even about resources. It's just do it. Build the school. Find the teachers that speak the language. Find those, and sure, use teachers that have gone through the teaching degrees and the co teachers' colleges at universities and colleges, etc. And they know the curriculums and everything else, but also know who they are. They know their language. They know their identity. And I'm not saying that they have to be ceremonial, because a large percentage of our people are Christian and non-traditional, and that's okay. That's that's not what I'm here saying. They have to. They have, all our kids have to suddenly start going to sweats and stuff. Mm -hmm but know the language and know our history, know our culture. Because you can have a culture without a religion or spirituality. You can participate in a lot of our ways without ever questioning whether you're going against your religion. And so I personally believe that if we just took the teachers, we funded our teachers. If we, we have the funding, every reserve does, whether they admit it or not, whether you always have the money to fund three or four people to go to college 
go to university, get their teaching degrees, get all their certificate certificates done. Hire a principal that cares about this stuff and seriously, genuinely cares about this stuff. Get them together and just say, okay, no more talking about it. Do it. We have the facilities. Build a facility if we don't have it. Build a school. We can always build a school. I don't care if it's a northern community or southern community. You can always build a school. A school is here. If that means that the kids are learning in my in my living room while we're waiting for the walls to go up on the actual school, then the kids are still learning. Beyond that, you need strong language teachers and you need connections with the elders in the community because they're the genuine teachers. They're the they're our old way teachers. They've always been our teachers. 